This week, I'm joined by Federico Testa to discuss the work of Jean-Marie Goyal, primarily from his book, The Ethics of Epicurus. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links for the Patreon in the descriptions below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Federico Testa, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thanks for having me. We are going to be discussing uh, the work within a certain context of a largely overlooked thinker called Jean-Marie Guyot, who the text that we're primarily going to be focusing on is one that was sent to me kindly by Bloomsbury, so thanks very much for them, The Ethics of Epicurus, uh, which was edited by yourself and Keith Ansel Pearson. And this is a reading of Epicurus by Guyot, and it deals with, as you'd imagine, Epicurus, morality, ethics, and a philosophy of life, energy, expenditure, and a lot of very interesting uh, readings of Epicurus in relation to a philosophy of life. But before we jump in with Guyot and the book, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and how it was um, this this book came to be. Well, first of all, thanks, um, James, for the invitation. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be with you today. Um, well, the book was actually part of a project on the notion of philosophy as a way of life. And I was invited by Keith Ansel Pearson, who co-edited the book with me to translate the book. I've done, I had already done some work on Guyot and the notion of life, and especially, you know, his sociology of art, which is actually in a way a metaphysics of art, um, because a lot of the ideas of vitalism and association are already present in that book on the sociology of art. And so for me, it was a great opportunity to learn more about Guillaume and to explore this um, study, which is, I would say, you know, unjustifiably neglected uh, in the history of philosophy, uh, which is the the book on the ethics of Epicurus, which was very influential. And Guillaume's work in the 19th century was widely read. Uh, it was very important. So it's mentioned by Nietzsche, by Kropotkin. Uh, so Nietzsche annotated, engaged with, um, you know, uh, has a lot of things to say about Gu in his copies of Guillaume's book. Some of it, some of it are praises. Some of it is, you know, just uh, sheer um, uh, aggression, right? <laughs> um, um, there's a lot of sympathy, nevertheless. So, you know, Bergson, Tolstoy, um, several figures uh, engaged. Gabri Gabriel Tard engaged with with Guillaume's work. So, it's for for some reason um, there is this gap in the history of philosophy where we stopped talking about Guillaume. Mm -hmm. Right. There are several ex explanations for this. Um, um, one of them is that, you know, in a way, commentators say that Guillaume's work was overshadowed by Nietzsche in terms of his eth ethics and in terms of its, let's say, ontology or reflection on time, for example, was overshadowed by uh, Bergson's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the reasons remain to be to be understood, but it's a fact that Guillaume became a marginal figure. And to contribute to this, you know, all the papers and drafts and manuscripts that Guillaume had uh, left was were lost, right? So um, Fouillet, who was Guillaume's stepfather, was sort of the custodian of his work. Um, he dies. Uh, Augustin, who's Guillaume's son, also dies in the war, in the First World War. And the papers are, are lost. So there's no actual manuscripts that we can go back to to figure out how Guyot actually composed his books, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's it's a situation where we're kind of, you know, left in the darkness a little bit. Mm. Did did he publish much? Did he write a lot? Yes, he he wrote a lot. He used to write uh, for journals. Um, so several journals. He was a, he was a, an assiduous sort of journal article writer. And some of his books, the Esquisse d'une morale sans obligation ni sanction, which is one of the main books, uh, the one that Nietzsche engages with, for example, um, a sketch of morality independent of obligation um, and sanction. Um, so this book 
in a way gathers other contributions he had already published as articles, um, especially the one that ref critically reflects on the notion of punishment and tries to dissociate, um, let's say, sens sensible um, or or sensorial pain or pleasure from the merits of action. So from moral fault, for example, he tries to dissociate the idea of committing a moral misdeed and the necessity to pay for it uh, in the realm of sens sensibility. Mm -hmm. So this was a this was a a widespread, widely read article. Um he published several books on um philosophical books, but also sort of he was a precursor in the beginnings of sociology, having published uh, a study on heredity, a study, a study that's posthumous, but it was published by 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 Fouillet, a study on the socio sociology of art. Um he has a book on what well, we could say we could call the sociology of religion, les religions de l'avenir, which uh, again was very important for several authors of the time, such as um, um, Emile Durkheim, for example, who you know whose notion of um, anomie and uh, whose analysis of religion is in a way um, taking place in a dialogue with Guyot. So he he published widely. He he was widely read and. Um, um, another striking feature of uh, Guillaume's trajectory is that he was always, in a way, external to the academic institution. Mm -hmm. So he his studies under the mentorship of Fouillet, who was his cousin and stepfather. And uh, he, by seventeen, when he was seventeen, he obtains his degree in philosophy letters. Um, he translated Epictetus's manual uh, handbook. And so from a very early age, he's already very well published and um, he will die, uh, I think, when he was 33 in 1888 in the south of France after this tragic event of, of an earthquake. He already had some kind of lung disease. And then after the earthquake, he, he his health kind of deteriorates and, and he dies. Mm. How old was he when he died? I think 33. So he had quite a productive. It was fairly prolific then. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Well, it's sort of in a way, it's nice to know that the outsiders of of philosophy have been forgotten uh, time and time again. It's another example. Yeah. Um, but before we we head forward into, I mean, I have a, I do have a question related to that, but I do want to uh, just ask you the hermetics question, perhaps to give us a foundation for this discussion. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room, listening on the conversation. Who do you pick? And uh, Gyo, Gyo is already in the room waiting. Right, so that, that's a very difficult question. I think that's the hardest question. I, I, I've listened to your um, other episodes, and uh, you know, I I always ask myself, who would I choose if I had to answer to this question? And it's really hard. I mean, one of the sort of options I have was to um, bring other thinkers from the nineteenth century and see who how they would discuss with Guyot, right? So I'd be very curious to have Nietzsche, Marx, and Gabriel Tard. Mm. Uh, discussing with Guillaume, I think that in this room, uh, these three thinkers would have very different ideas about society, subjectivity, um, you know, um, Epicurus. Uh, and so I think if we're talking about the, the 19th century, I would go with these three. Of course, another another option I had was to, you know, get different thinkers from different periods of of the history of philosophy. You know, if I could include an early modern, I'll definitely like to hear Spinoza. Um, you know, antiquity. I'd be curious to hear, I don't know, an Eximander or, or Plato, uh, not to say Epicurus. So I don't know. So maybe I'll, I'll just stick to the uh, 19th century uh, answer and stop there. What's the what's the central thread between those four? Sort of, a, do you see it as a philosophy of life? I think in a way, yes. I think, you know, it's clearer for Nietzsche and for Guillaume and Tard, maybe. L not as clear for Marx, in a way, even though perhaps one could have this kind of reading of Marx. Um, I think also the relationship between, you know, the the self and the collective, or, you know, the, the collective grounds of selfhood, if you will, I think these thinkers are... 
concerned with it in very different ways, right? In Nietzsche, you have a very different idea of what this kind of uh, plural self is uh, than you have in Tard um, or Marx. Um, but I think that, you know, a, a thinker like um, Tard has this very interesting idea of association and of so- sociology, not as this kind of individual um, specific realm of knowledge, uh, but as sort of a perspective that allows you to see reality as the set of phenomena of association, mm-hmm. uh, which I think Guillaume is very sympathetic to. Mm-hmm. Who do you think is leading? I mean, what was Guillaume like in personality wise? Would he be? Would he be leading the charge in that room or? Oh well, you know, if we trust Fouillet's um, description, um, I think Guillaume would be very shy. He'll be probably observing in a corner. You know, I think Nietzsche and Marx would be very passionate. Uh, Tard, I'm not sure. I think he would also be more of a of a serene kind of a listener. Um, but but Guillaume has, you know, in, in Fouillet's view, this kind of placid personality, very contemplative, um, very you know all about reflection and tranquility in a way, even though, you know, different elements appear in his work. For example, the love for um, for, for for danger and for risk and the value of struggle. These things appear in Guillaume's work. But if we trust Fouillet's depiction of his personality, you know, Guillaume would, would be someone who would be writing under the shade of, a, of an olive tree in the south of France, you know, <laughs> looking at the Mediterranean in this kind of idyllic Epicurean um, um, scenario. Mm. So in relation to that room, in the in the sense that the thread there is the philosophy of life, you mentioned that he wrote quite a lot and seemingly quite eclectically in his short life. Mm. Would you say that that's the thread between between his, his works as well, even though they are quite different, that it is, they, they will come back to some notion of a philosophy of life? Um, I think in a way, yes. I think this is perhaps less clear in this in this work on Epicurus. This is, I mean, I must say this this work on Epicurus um is a is a dissertation that Guillaume wrote for uh, um for competition of the Academie des Sciences Morales et Politiques. Uh and that the competition was announced in 1871 and um it asked for for um reflections on utilitarian morality. Hmm. Guillaume uh, submits his dissertation in 74, right? It's a very long dissertation. It's something around um, 1,000 pages. Um, <laughs> and the, this dissertation would later become, become two different books. There is the publication of the first part of the dissertation, and we'll call La Morale de Picture. And the um, the other part will be published as uh, La Morale Anglaise Contem- Contemporaine. So, uh, in the second part, you already have more elements of a critique mm-hmm. of hedonism and utilitarian philosophy, uh, including a reflection on on a philosophy of life. Um, I believe that the elements of a philosophy of life are already can already be found, and some of the elements can already be found as a reflection on Epicurus. Um, but definitely for for this book onward, the notion of life will be will be very important, right? And Guillaume's notion of life is a very interesting one, right? Because um, you know he thinks of life as a sort of expansive, social, and cooperative phenomenon, mm-hmm. right? So for him, as we will say in the esquisse, right, there are two main movements that characterize life or living things, living phenomena. The first is the gravitation upon self, which for him explains the egoistic drives towards self-preservation or hedonistic behaviors, right? Mm-hmm. On the one hand, so this pole of egoism. And on the other hand, there's this pole of expenditure, of expansion, generosity, you know, which for him would ex- explain the social drives, um, uh, movements of altruism, and the refined pleasures involving others. Now, the main sort of concept that Guillaume uses to uh, define his notion of life is the notion of fecundity, right? Mm-hmm. And fecundity is basically the 
you know, for him, it's it's made evidence in different processes of life, such as reproduction, for example. But it, it designates that expansion of life and its energy through, in, and with others, right? So is this idea that sociability and generosity, in a way, are inscribed in life itself, right? And, that, and, and if, for it to sort of unfold and even preserve itself in existence, it has to communicate itself, has to associate, it has to uh, expand itself. So he says that the most intense life is also the, the most sociable life, right? And uh, there are beautiful quotes, for example, where he says things like, Life like fire only maintains maintains itself by communicating itself, by, by spreading, but also spending itself in a way. Mm. So there's also um, an account of this need for the expenditure that characterizes the, the movement of life. So I think um, Rio is concerned with, you know, thinking beyond of what, what he calls the narrow um, sh- shell of the self, right? Mm-hmm. But without forgetting that there is a fundamental sort of egoistic or self-interested, self-referred, if you will, uh, movement in life. So in the sense, he's a realist. He's trying to propose this ethics of generosity, this ethics of sociability, this idea that, you know, a life that is, you know, fully um, realized is also a life that is open to the other, to the collective, to association, but without sort of um, forgetting the dimension of, yeah, this gravitation upon self. But I mean, I guess to to move the, the conversation to the ethics of Epicurus itself, I mean, just to begin with an, uh, an opening question to a layer broad foundation, why Epicurus? That's interesting. I think that that's a great question. It's not evident, right? So if you... Um, Bear in mind that the book was actually a contribution on la morale utilitaire. So it's a book on the history of utilitarianism. It, it's a book on the under, history and critique of utilitarianism. Um, Guyot basically displaced the theme of this 1871 competition of the Academy uh, des Sciences Morales et Politiques by situating it in antiquity, situating the discussion in antiquity. And he thinks that, you know... Um, because he had this, he has this vitalistic idea of how to do history of philosophy. He has this vitalist method. He thinks that um, systems of thought should be thought of as organisms, as living entities that develop throughout time, that evolve according to their own processes, but also according to the um, the challenges and the debates, uh, they and the resistances they face um, in the exterior world, world, right, and the and the challenges they face in the world, and so for him, he thinks, according to this kind of or- organic idea of what is a philosophical system, that the notion of pleasure, the notion of pleasures, pleasure and utility are already present in Epicureanism. They're fully expressed in Epicureanism. So for him. The history of utilitarianism, the history of modern utilitarianism, is actually to be understood as a continuation, a development, an unfolding of Epicurus, Epicurean morality. Mm. Right. So it's it's developing the principles that first emerged in Epicureanism and bringing them to fruition in modernity. So basically, and there's another interesting point here because he thinks of the whole history of ethics as a sort of agonistic struggle. Uh, between a confrontation between a principle of duty, which is a rational principle, right? It's a principle uh, based on non-empirical principles and, and rules, rational obligation that you find, for example, in Plato and the Stoics uh, and, and in, in Kant, right? But I think the main example here is Stoicism, like kind of fundamental Stoicism. And on the other hand, the other principle as a, pl- a principle of uh, sensibility, right? The principle of pleasure, this empirical principle of of enjoyment, according to, according to it, to which you cannot conceive of an abstract good without a sensible element. Mm-hmm. And so, for Guillaume, the history of morality is basically the history of the counterposition of these two positions, right? 
Um, and and so in a way against Kant, I think, what Guillaume is trying to do is to affirm the dignity, if you will, of this principle, of this empirical principle of pleasure and sensibility as a guiding principle in, in morality, at least in the ethics of Epicurus. Mm. Um, I think this will change a little bit later, but I think this is what he's looking for um, in Epicurus. Now, there's another aspect that's very interesting and important. I think, you know, also speaking to the sociology of his time, speaking to the discussions on individualism and altruism and modernity as the sort of age of individualism in a way, um, discussions that I that are you know present in Fourier and in, in Durkheim and in the, in the beginnings of, of sociology in France, um, is very concerned to find some kind of synthesis between self interest and collective well being, mm-hmm. right? And this is one of the main points that he will try to find in Epicureanism. So not only immorality of pleasure or an ethics of enjoyment, and we'll talk more about this. I think, but also uh, a way to articulate, you know, individual interest, individual enjoyment, and collective emancipation, collective liberation, collective enjoyment, if you will. So uh, the second part of this Epicurus book is a reflection on how uh, there were social virtues in Epicureanism, and it traces a history of a tradition concerned with building a society on the basis of the of these virtues, right? Mm. And not only that, but he also traces the history of the, you know, the the, the philosophies of the social pact, uh, ideas of social contract, um, ideas of, you know, c- collective association, voluntary, intentional collective association. He traces them back to Epicureanism. So Epicureanism for him appears as both this, this ethics for the individual, self cultivation, right, and as a way to at least try to attempt to synthesize um, individual self-cultivation and collective emancipation. Mm. I want to jump back to something you said, because I, th- I think it's important and hope I think it might open up also the energy, the, the notion of energy and expenditure. You mentioned that uh, Gyo understands systems and philosophies as, as living. So it's an organic understanding of these things as living. Does that inherently mean they're also dying, that they're mortal? Yeah, I think I think so. I think in a way <clears throat> that's I think he mentions that in that introduction to the book which he wrote that's when he published the book. So after he wrote the dissertation, this is a, an introduction that was written later when he already had developed fully developed his philosophy of life. Um but I think that is a sort of corollary of, of this claim that, you know, living things they they have a beginning, they have a development and they have a process of deterioration. And death. So hmm. perhaps I would say that that's a necessary consequence of that analogy, right? So um, perhaps he sees modernity as the moment of Epicureanism. Hmm. But perhaps if you if you look at his later work where he talks about, you know, the um, um, the gradual moving away of you know humankind from moral principles and um you know his critique of hedonism and utilitarianism uh then perhaps even if epicureanism is the mod- modern philosophy par excellence maybe you know nothing assures us that it will always be right mm. and guillot himself then develops a critique of epicureanism so he reassesses the notion of duty in his work um so that that's also very important because the esquisse, right, the the sketch of morality. In this book, Guillaume Guillaume Guillo criticizes um, the idea of pleasure as a guiding principle um, mm-hmm. for morality for life, right? And he reassesses duty. He says that uh, we must re- redefine, redescribe duty from the perspective of this naturalistic philosophy of life, right? And once we do that, once we have that philosophy of life, it is the unfolding of life itself, the movement of life itself, uh, which it could translate, for example, in the in the human realm for uh, activity activity itself, that um, is primordial, right? So pleasure is not what you're aiming for, but it's a corollary 
of the growth and expansion and affirmation of life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's less of a philosophy of pleasure and a philosophy that accounts for pleasure from the perspective of this vitalism. Mm -hmm. And then he proposes four sort of equivalents of duty Mm -hmm. that we can sort of um, propose um, once we have a philosophy of life. So the power of acting, right? The duty to act when you have the energy and power to act, right? The which is associated to this intrinsic I- idea to turn thought into action. Another principle would be a fusion of sensibilities, right? So uh, the affirming the tendency we have of moving towards others, and finally that which he calls the the love of risk and struggle, right? The idea that. You know, in situations of danger, life affirms itself more with more intensity. That risk is a medium for life to develop itself, right? And in all these principles, we know this kind of moving away from a more egoistic morality, which he will then call the mutilation of self, right? And the uh, and pleasure appearing as an epiphenomenon of life, if you will, or uh, something that is simultaneous to um to activity and unfolding so these four duties these acting fusing of sensibility to risk and struggle there appears to be a sort of possible like usurping of something a defense of something what are these duties defending is is this is solely like a living battle against entropy entropy is that so? You, we have this this energy and expenditure, this this moving of the egoistic self towards towards a, an energy which is then you know pushed out towards the the communal. But this this duty is there a greater teleology? Where are we going? Yeah, I think we're going to the um, to the expansion of life, right? So and this expansion. So if there is a, th- I I don't, I don't agree. I mean, I would be careful mm-hmm. to say that Guyo has a, the- a theology, okay, right? Good. Um, but there is, in, in the beginning of the case, this reflection that if we are to understand the laws of life, we must look at how life behaves, right? How it acts. He has this idea of the marksman and the, and the sort of, you can see, you know, what a marksman is aiming for if you look at the marks of, of the, even the missed shots, right? You can mm-hmm. see, uh, what 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 they were aiming for if you if you compare the different points and the, so there is a bit of that of looking at what is the effort of life and then trying to deduce laws right but these laws are not transcendent that's that's Guyot's point they they must be imminent laws they must mm. be uh linked to sort of um trends and impulses that are part of life itself so in a way the equivalence of duty, they are a translation of these trends, mm-hmm. right? Um, now, you could say that that leaves us with not a lot in terms of um, deliberation and 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 human ethics, right? Mm. So, Fouillet seemed to have noticed this, and he says in his book, uh, Nietzsche Limoralism, he compares uh, Guyot and Nietzsche, and he says that, you know, whereas Nietzsche thought that the expansion of life, they're both thinkers of the expansion, affirmation, and intensity of life. But whereas Nietzsche thought that um, the expansion of life has as its goal the, you know, augmentation of power, um, Guyot thinks that power itself does not explain. We still have to... Um, um, choose moral ends, right? And this mm. is for his reading. So the expansion of life, it denotes the dynamic of life, but the moral ends remain to be defined, remain to be posited. And this is, you know, in a way, um, I think accurate because Guyot has this notion of anomie, right? Which, which is a notion that, you know, an attempt to think of a morality beyond or post obligation and and sanction mm. where you know we don't have the support of transcendent universal principles anymore mm-hmm. uh we do know how life behaves 
Uh, but it's up to us to define what the ends are, right? So he he uses this uh, image of a vessel of, of a ship, uh, you know, and um, we're left alone in this ship, and and we must learn how to how to command it, how to pilot it. Um, and this is sort of you know the metaphor he uses for the diagnosis of the moral and ethical situation of modernity. So in this way, that um, you know, if we as reading makes sense, if we consider that that point this so is less of a teleology and more of a of this idea of this anomic situation where there is space for human agency to define uh moral ends this is a question that uh, yeah i i, I, I perhaps a tough question that i wanted to ask that in this in the sense that you men- mentioned you know the marksman you can look at where he's aiming at and even the missed shots allow us to refine what 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 the, the vector the target is that seems to me to be a sort of um almost a vitalist appreciation of natural selection there seems to be a darwinian edge here in the sense that well when we look at life there is this okay that didn't work refining refining towards something and then it keeps moving but in the sense that this is imminent uh gyo is bringing in some some space where duty as a conscious decision via human beings can take place but we are still part of that so yeah. there seems to be a struggle of a we're we're with we're, it we're of course we're of course within the imminence we mm. are imminent within the life as it is but we are also we're something within that that is making a conscious decision so this isn't simply a um you know simply a sort of spencerian darwinianism which is quite uh deterministic no, that's right. I think uh, there's a lot of Spencer and Darwin. You know, Guyot is a son of his time, right? He was reading these things. This is, you know, a lot of his philosophical um, f- f- education, uh, apart from the ancients, is in that kind of thought. Um, he is, in a way, an evolutionist uh, mm-hmm. with all the, you know, qualities and problems that that had at the time, also politically speaking. Um, but... Um, I think your interpretation sort of, um, yeah, in a way translates what Fouillet is trying to say when he compares Guillaume and each other. There is the space. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there is, we can still define where we're aiming for. And in a way, you know, perhaps duty is this conscious way to relate to a dynamic that goes beyond what we can consciously, consciously um, um, define, right? Mm-hmm. So, they give us principles to of action mm. that are at the same time descriptive, right? But also they guide uh, us in a way um, ethically. So I think in this in this sense, uh, Guyot is a bit of a Spinozist, you know, in the sense that um, there is this idea of not simply sort of denying, demeaning, or, or laughing at. Um, the traits that you find in human beings, but understanding them and then, you know, ethically working with them. Right. And so perhaps that would be a way to look at this equivalence of duty. Of course, um, you know, at least in the book on Epicurus, Guyot is a critic of the notion of necessity that would, that would open a whole other discussion, but he's not ready to accept that sort of full determinism Mm. that, that other thinkers of the time seem to be subscribing to. And so in giving in to pleasure and hedonism, which he's very critical of, would we perhaps sort of just settled for almost like the most base element of our evolutionary trajectory? We've sort of just laid down and thought, wow, this is good. No, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to um, expend any of our energy on a duty towards something more, towards um, a social harmony, which I think for Gyo will never be. But in the process of going towards something more is that duty and giving into hedonism or pleasure would simply be like a, a very enjoyable, but we sort of a laying down and dying to evolution without any conscious decision. That's interesting. I think that's that's an interesting way to phrase it. Um, I think his problem is not as critical of the feeling of enjoyment itself, right? So the especially in the book on it, so he becomes critical of a morale or morality that is guided by pleasure as a principle because pleasure is not 
um, let's say, primitive primordial as a principle, as a consequence, right? As a corollary of life. Mm. So when you think that you're acting um, to achieve pleasure, you're actually uh, sort of, in a way, uh, misconceiving the um, or, or the sort of description of moral action. You're, you're misdescribing uh, human activity. Mm. We name it pleasure. We we obtain pleasure because we act, because life unfolds. So life is primordial. Pleasure is secondary. So I think that's the first critique he would have to hedonism. The second thing, which you know, it's the the calculation that you find in Epicurus again. In the Epicurus book, this is still praised as sort of an artifice of intelligence uh, to organize a rational life uh, and a beautiful life. Uh, in a way, life is a work of art. Um, the sage organizes his life, crafts his life as a work of art, precisely because he can uh, calculate the consequences of pleasures and pains, right? And then he can freely choose between pleasure and pain, even if it's trying to achieve uh, pleasure, he knows that sometimes he will necessarily have to choose pain over pleasure. Uh, and this is a discussion we can have why that is the case, because Guyot has a very particular reading of Epicureanism in that regard. Um, so, so he still in this book is still valuing the the principle of pleasure, um, but the principle of pleasure is then reassessed in the. In the uh, esquisse, in the later work, as a sort of epiphenomenal uh, uh, instance that relates to life, right? So, I think you're right to say that perhaps you know a simple hedonism, even though again Guyot is concerned with rehabilitating the dignity of pleasure, but a simple hedonism, he will come to realize cannot account for the risky endeavors and for the sort of you know full unfolding of life in all its in all its dimension with all its complexity right you need to go beyond pleasure to understand that i'm always reluctant to ask about suffering because i wonder if my mm. listeners will start to worry about me because i think it, <laughs> i ask about it in terms of most discussions but i think it's so important because it's something that yes is uh Maybe it's the it's not a necessity because it's beyond necessity in the fact that it just is. But what does Gyo state in the sense that he's talking about pleasure, morality, ethics? I mean, pain and suffering. There, what are we to what are we to do with it? Are we to use it uh, in terms of energy of it and expenditure, or is that what's his relationship with it? It's interesting, right? Because in the esquisse, uh, what Gyo proposes is that life is so rich, right, and it's so sort of uh, sociable and generous that you can even there are moments when it can you know um let go of itself for others so there is this kind of extreme altruism that would presuppose even accepting suffering mm. um so and that's again an element that free is very um concerned with highlighting because it you know he, he wants to show that the the this powerful altruism in in Guyot. Now, in terms of the Epicurus book, I think um, suffering is part of a rational organization of passions, right? So, first of all, there's a kind of critical assessment of suffering and enjoyment. Mm. Uh, the critical assessment is to say, you know, um, what is really pleasure and what is really suffering, right? And and then he, of course, he goes back to this classic Epicurean idea of pleasure as the absence of, um, you know, disturbance in the mind and pain in the body. So aponia, right? And ataraxia, right? So this idea that, you know, it is the tranquility of mind and it is the uh, stability of your sort of bodily composition. So you're not hungry, you're not thirsty, you're not in pain. Uh, and you're not disturbed by by passions, you know, in your mind, uh, that you have pleasure. So pleasure is described as this immediate sort of feeling of existence, the sentiment of being alive. That is that is enough for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And suffering is the opposite of that. It's anything that deprives you of that. Mm. So pleasure is not something you add to life, and suffering 
is not something necessarily necessarily terrible. Um, it's just a lack that you can easily fill, if you will, mm. right? Uh, either with nourishment uh, or you know with a, a way to account for or in a way overcome the passions of the mind. Now, um, some sorts of pain don't go away, mm. right? No matter how how much effort you make, uh, you know, if, if you're having like a serious illness, you will be in suffering. Mm. So the Epicurean has a whole series of mechanisms to deal with that, mm -hmm. which involve what Guillaume will call the pleasures of the soul, mm. the pleasures that involve memory, the pleasures that involve uh, looking at the moments of bonheur, looking at the moments of happiness in the past, or in a way situating the present feeling of pain or the present uh, dis disturbance of the mind, the present passion of the mind, of the soul, in a wider time. And this is very interesting because he uses an analogy and uh, it's almost like a spiritual exercise to use Hadot's expression, mm -hmm. uh, Pierre Hadot, where you should think of your passion, right? Of your emotion as through this analogy of atoms, space, emotions, time. So if atoms that are in a compressed, are compressed in a small space, right? Mm -hmm. And they're moving really fast and colliding against one another. And, you know, they're in full agitation. They might seem, their energy might seem very powerful, right? And easy, difficult to contain. Uh, if you spread this, these atoms in, the, in space, they will move more easily they will collide much less and so you know that 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 movement will be will be uh, somehow less problematic less disturbing less violent right the same thing for the passions if a single passion seems to be to overpower me in the present right in the present moment if i look at this passion from the perspective of what he calls Holos bios, right? The whole of a lifetime. Mm. Then the power of this passion appears in its reality and appears uh, much weaker than I could have perceived it if I was completely positioning my myself in the present. So we should look at our passions in this way. We should look at our suffering in this way, sort of uh, from the perspective of the whole of our lives, right? Mm. And evaluate them from that perspective. There's another element to this, uh, to suffering. Sometimes when suffering leads to more stable, more lasting, and more beautiful mm. forms of pleasure, Rio says that the Epicurean sage will accept to suffer. So there will be a, an element of, again, the introduction of temporality, right? If and, and this is very interesting because many, many interpreters read Epicurus as this philosopher of the present, of the joy of the present. And um, for Epicurus, uh, for Guillaume, Epicurus is a philosopher of the future as well, uh, a thinker of temporality who, you know, is not concerned merely with, merely with the uh, belonging to the present of enjoyment, but also... Um, spiritually if you will uh understanding how the present pr a present enjoyment or present pain will contribute to a beautiful life as a whole mm -hmm. so it's always felt the, the 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 moment beat of pleasure or pain is always filtered by this reflection on the future mm -hmm. by this reflection on this totality that's being built and coherently gradually being brought together by the epicurean that seems to me you were discussing in a way, atomism. It seems to me mm. that Gyo is synthesizing Lucretius and Epicurus in the sense of utilizing that sort of focusing in on the swerve, which then builds into a structured space. But uh, we could say synthesizing that with Epicurean thought in the sense that it becomes something that you have a conscious relationship with. And that thing which arises spontaneously, which pain and suffering often does, a conscious decision to allow that suffering to become something more. So the swerve evolves, which is often a completely, well, it is a spon completely spontaneous act within the evolution of life on that atomic level. Uh, 
but then the human is almost separate from it and can make a decision to allow that thing to bolster their ethics or lay down and become a hedonist. That's interesting. Again, I think I I would I would be more a bit more careful okay. in, in making this distinction, just because. Uh, and this is a very important chapter of Guyot's book that you know he is a chapter he re, he wrote after um, the um, the critique of his thesis, mm. uh, uh, and it's basically he has has this chapter on the swerve, right, the klinamen or the parenclesis, and. What is interesting there is that, you know, the Epicurean wants to have spontane- spontaneity in nature. Mm-hmm. And this is how they found um, um, human freedom. But the thing is, if there is, if we're made out of at- atoms, right, like other bodies, and our souls are also atomic atomistic constructions right encounter of atoms different kinds of atoms more subtle atoms more ethereal atoms but still atoms right still Mm -hmm. material that's the epicurean notion um then the principles that we find in the human being they must be found in the totality of nature as well Mm -hmm. so the idea is if we have spontaneity in human beings if we have freedom in human beings this is precisely because we find the germ of this freedom, if you will, and germinal state and the atoms themselves spread throughout nature itself. Mm. Right. So um, and, and this is interesting because it connects to uh, Epic Guillaume's reading of Epicurus um, critique of a certain conception of the divine as a, an efficient cause. Mm. Um, he thinks that. um Okay, you know, for Epicurus, atoms are eternal, indivisible, um, they're in constant movement, etc. And then there's the spark of the swerve, which initiates the the um, uh, production of worlds, right? And these worlds, they are produced, uh, but they can also be dismantled, disappear. There are infinite worlds that are produced and disappear. Um, so the... Guillaume's concern is to make very clear that um, the, the, um, the the spontaneity that produces the world doesn't disappear once the world is produced. So it's not that there was a moment where an atom served and then the world was produced and then everything sort of is territorialized in necessity, right? Mm-hmm. No, it's, the swerve is always happening everywhere, right? It can always happen everywhere. There are regularities in nature. And there are, you know, Lucretius has an account of this determinate seeds that have to produce, you know, their outcome. But also, again, nothing come from nothing, nothingness. There is a regularity in the way things are produced in nature, but there is a degree of spontaneity as well. And so the human human ethics wouldn't be in opposition to to nature in the sense Epicurus and Guyot in this book are naturalists, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it will be sort of an expression of a principle that is already in na- nature, right? Again, the principle doesn't tell us what to do, right? The swerve doesn't doesn't tell us that, um, you know, we should live the Epicurean way of life. The Epicurean way of life is made possible because of the spontaneity of the swerve. So this element of contingency here is very important. Is it, this seems a little bit cyclic. That things mm. things rise and fall. Would would that even would that apply to the ethics, or or is there a push towards some harmony, and not a teleology, but is something being built from this con- from these conscious decisions? Yeah, I mean, things are being built, right? So society can be built. So uh, you know, Gio has a whole um, a whole part of his book, the last part of his book, trying to account for ways in which we we can build associations. To mm-hmm. constitute like a stable society that provides uh, well-being and enjoyment for its members, so he's trying to build things, right? Um, ep- so he, the same thing is valid for Epicurus. Epicurus had a had a, a view of uh, society as intentional, voluntary association in a way. In Guillaume's reading, now um, the sort of cyclical aspect. I'm not so sure about. I think that would be more of a stoic sort of idea that you know there are cycles that are 
necessary and they happen in a certain way and you know or or even a neoplatonist idea or even an early christian neoplatonist like origen for example who would say you know god will create um you know the the number of wor- worlds that is necessary for everyone to save their their souls right so mm-hmm. there will be like this constant destruction of worlds and the you know the creation of a new world for those who couldn't save themselves in the previous world so that they can act using their free will act in a way they're saved and you know some of them won't and then god will create a new world or the stoic idea of the conflagration conflagration of worlds um that comes from heraclitus so i think that the Epicurean Lucretian way is um, you don't have that regularity of the rise and fall of worlds. You know, you, you can have infinite worlds, but they're all stem from contingency. Mm. So you cannot, you cannot account or you cannot sort of posit a regular rise and fall of worlds or, you know, the, or that the worlds that will, you know, be produced tomorrow will be the same as the worlds that were were produced today, right? So there is there is that. So there's less of that regularity. But nevertheless, there is an attention to build things, right? Mm-hmm. So nature builds things, right? Nature uh creates regularity. And and human beings can also strive to create regularity without there, however, um you know, excluding this contingency and this spontaneity that's found both in human action and in nature. How has uh, Gyo affected your own life? How has Gyo? How, how has this philosophy affected your own life? Have you found because, in the sense that Epicureanism, you know, as I understand it, was quite a, it's almost like a school, a very practical philosophy. Mm. Um, did you see that same possibility in Gyo to use it almost like a manual as a as a conscious means to develop a personal ethic? Mm, I think I think we we have we don't have a lot of biographical information in how Gio lived apart from you know his generosity, his amiability, the fact that he wrote his books under the shade of an olive tree, you know things like that. Mm. Um, so I think Gio was definitely someone who was concerned with you know the the simple life and, um, but also you know someone who was constantly challenging himself. And he even even in his discussion on risk, he says that, you know, um uh the struggle uh, enhances life, even if it's a struggle against an invisible opponent, for example, illness, right? And so he definitely saw this element of agonism and you know um conflict and struggle as an element that can bring about growth. So I would say that I don't think Guyot is an Epicurean, and I don't think that he looks for a manual uh, for um, for ethics in in Epicurus. Also, because as he told us, and uh, as he as he writes in the Esquis, we are in this anomic um, uh, age where we are given no principles. Right? It's it's up to us. And and at some point, he says that in this age. Um, our task is the task of individual originality rather than un- uniformity. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a task of almost, almost, if you will, a task of eccentricity, a, a task of creating, creating a life, crafting your life. Um, again, following maybe perhaps the um, the equivalence of duty, the the sociable, generous um, fecundity of life, but also, you know being able to affirm this originality this eccentricity so yeah i would say no i don't think he finds this 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 recipe in epicureanism and indeed he becomes critical of epicureanism but like few um commentators he sort of gave us a very original creative and you know transformative picture of epicurus and and we can definitely learn a lot from it in terms of you know how to equate a, an ethics of you know a consequentialist ethic with you know an idea of virtue and self cultivation, uh, so there are a lot of clues in how we can rethink a lot of the moral categories we use today by reading Guyot's work. But again, it's not a recipe. Uh, 
but it's, it's definitely a very good critical exercise. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to add about the, the ethics of Epicurus specifically that you feel we've, we've glossed over? No, I think, I think, you know, um, I think we we perhaps touched upon some of the main parts and some of the main aspects of the book. Um, I maybe would like to add that in the next month, on the next month or so, um, there will be a paperback edition of the book. Uh, so available uh, online on your nearest bookshop. So feel free to buy, read, criticize, engage with it. It's really worth it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you currently working on more Guyo translations or texts, or is that? I'm currently writing a text on Guyo and and penal abolitionism. Um, so there is, you know, I think we have strong grounds to claim that Guyo was a one of the precursors of abolition mm -hmm. and his critique of punishment, his critique of sanction. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to show how that appears in his work, um, especially this article. On the idea of sanction, it was a, it was a very popular article he wrote. Um, but at the moment, I'm not translating. I'm not doing any other tra geo translation at the moment. I'm just working on this particular particular. Oh, I'm also working on a different um, text on friendship uh, on, on Guillaume's reading of Epicurus and and how yeah how that can provides us with clues to think of the organization of collective enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So those are the thing the main text i'm working on at the moment okay well i'll be sure to put the link for the ethics of epicurus in the description below and as you said there's going to be a paperback version soon i mean is, is there much else of gills in translation or would you say that this is probably the best place to start for beginners well because i want people to read this book i'm going to say start with this book it's also the first book right um so it's nice to start with the first there's something about reading an, an author and starting with their, their first book. There's, I don't know, something about it. And especially if you're following Guillaume's vitalistic insight, you know, you see how his thought is and the key ideas of his thought are developing throughout time. But there's there's a there's a no translation uh, from the 19th century, I think, of the esquisse. So a sketch of morality without obligation or sanction is also available. I think there are translations of his book on uh, heredity and his um, sociology of art, if I'm not mistaken. And definitely there's a translation of the um, Irreligion de l'Avenir, I think, also from the late 19th century, early 20th century translation. So to be revised, I think translated under the title, uh, The Non-Religion of the Future. So I think these are the main books available in translation. Okay. Well, as I said, I'll put the links for the Ethics of Epicurus in the description below for those who want to purchase it. But um, Federico Testa, thanks very much. Thanks very, very much, James. It was, a, it was a real pleasure for me to be here.